hear me? Huh? Can you hear me? Yes. Connection? Yes, I can. All right. Good. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me share my screen with everyone. So okay. I'm happy to welcome our next invited speaker, Yuval Burstyn, uh, who's going to be talking to us about the paleohydro geology of Sura Cave in Israel. Hi, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, and thank you Ing, for that review, highlighting all the difficulties in working with the Smiley Deems and also the benefits. I'm gonna pre present a project that we did investigating Holocene palohydrological variations inferred from magnetic and isotopic properties in two stalagmites from Sorek Cave, Israel. Now, did, this project uh, is the brainchild of Von Chal and Rambert Matthews. Um, Johnny Kenan Yanabert helped with the at the Hebrew University of Nerealon at the Geological Survey. And this whole project is a part of something Josh and Ron has been working on for uh, quite a few years now, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you in the next few slides a brief and very generalized review of studies using. IRM time series as Palo environmental proxies. Just for reference, there's a nice table by uh, uh, Jaquero uh, et al, uh, 2021 in the Frontiers um, special issue. So you can check that out. But just in case, uh, let's see the next slide. So this one is uh, a very classic Born et al, 2015. Uh, Larry also showed this one. So I get to uh, kind of briefly go through it. The wetter conditions of the interglacials show high, higher IRM um, values um, compared to the glacial conditions, which they interpret as hot, um, wetter summer conditions. So just to generalize again, high IRM, wetter conditions. Um, we also see the same thing in Chinese Spirithium. So, I mean, uh, we looked at the USA mid latitude Spirithium, and now we're in China across the world, again, mid latitudes. And we're looking at this cave, this time the Holocene. And we're seeing these high values. This time it's uh, not only normalized by mass, but uh, normalized by time. So you get the particle flux into the cave. and in the sample, you can see that when models and some records indicate higher storm activity due to El Nino southern oscillation, you get the more magnetic rich layers. There are some other works uh, looking at these type of caves and seeing this type of high IRM equals wetter conditions, but uh, not a lot. So you can all uh, just read through them in a day, read through them in a day, but uh, I'm going to skip to the Tropical, a tropic cave closer to the equator. This classic work by Jacado et al. 2016, looking at almost anything you can look at in, uh, in environmental magnetism and the Spiele theme, everything you can measure. And, but all these parameters seem to co vary together. And what they show is that the higher values. So the, the more magnetized layers are, uh, they form at the same time with positive delta C13 values, which indicate warmer, drier conditions, less vegetation, which causes uh, destabilization of the soil, which washes into the cave. Now I've added here this insert with, from uh, Roger's recent paper. He's gonna describe his um, work I'm not going to do it for him, but as you increase resolution, you can even you can go from these generalized conclusions of high IRM, unstable soil, drier conditions to really look into what's happening um, and what's causing the, these um, magnetic reach layers. Right. So what we wanted to do is well, first we had this um, method question that we wanted to resolve: How do we compare several Speleothene, several stalagmites from the same cave on the same uh, time series and the same axe. And then we can start asking the questions that we want to explore, which is 
what can these interactions between magnetic properties and isotopic proxies uh, tell us about uh, um, different hydroclimate settings within the Holocene, so within the interglacials, uh, the last, <laughs> the recent interglacial, and can we link it to the soil and vegetation dynamics? Now, I've been mentioning climate periods a lot, so just to um, kind of focus on us on what we're going to discuss. So we're going to be looking at a sample, a stalagmite from early Holocene, and that's going to be 2-20. And this one records a transition from wet eastern Mediterranean conditions associated with Saprobel 1, and moving to the mid-Holocene, it's a stalagmite 11-24, which was used to investigate millennial dry, uh, wet dry cycles in the Mediterranean. So these are bond-like cycles and they trigger or associated with cultural changes. So this is really interesting to us from an historical and archeological point of view. All right, so just a little bit of the climate. The Eastern Mediterranean is part of the global desert belt, um, though, Specifically, the Eastern Mediterranean coastline is less arid than expected because it gets a lot of uh, moisture from Mediterranean cyclones. The general climate is wet winters and dry rainless summers. But as you can see, the cave, the Sorek Cave, is right on the border between the Mediterranean environment and the arid desert climate. So what we get is this sensitive recorder of desertification, um, climate change and seasonality change is really interesting, but we don't get this resolution in uh, magnetism, color magnetism. Um, okay, as I mentioned, it's located on the Western slope of Judean mountains, 40 kilometers from the Mediterranean Sea, at an elevation of 400 meters, just uh, rainfall is 500 millimeters a year and it's mostly limited to the winter month with infiltration limited to um, December through February. So not a lot of hydrological action in the cave. <laughs> uh, soil, which is where we get our signal and we'll talk about it later, occurs at 30 to 100 centimeter pockets, which cover about 50% uh, of the surface. Uh, surface coniferous forest and C3 shrubland and the rock thickness above the cave varies from 10 to over 50 meters. Now, just a general overview of the Sorek isotope record as a whole. It spans over 180,000 years. It is the quintessential proxy time series for the Eastern Mediterranean has been used in a lot of studies to identify, bracket, and interpret global regional climate change. So, this is why we chose this site and we were hoping to get interesting results. And I, you know, I hope we can convince you that we did. Um, so now to the samples. This is uh, 220 I mentioned earlier. Um, I've highlighted the differences between the two. So this one's located under 10 meters of bedrock cover and its growth rate is relatively slow up to 100 micro, micrometers a year. Uh, it, does record a positive Delta C13 excursion, which is used to time separate, like terrestrial occurrence of Sepropel 1 condition. And on the other side, we have uh, stalagmite 1124. This is a mid Holocene sample. It's deeper in the cave under 25 to 30 meters of bedrock, and its growth rate is much faster. That's about half a millimeter a year. And this one was used, again, to study the mid-Holocene cycles. All right, so um, just a quick overview of the age model. We didn't use the composite SOREC age model because the, the isotope um, measurements and the magnetic me measurements are about 10 to 20 years apart. So we reanalyzed and remeasured the samples and recalculated the age models for each of the stalagmites. So now we know that the, they're, they're physically matched. So, uh, right. So this age model specifically may not look as the original Sorek record, but it's definitely very close to it. 
All right, so the first thing we want to do is, you know, look at search for that uh, origin of magnetic signal. We went to the environmental SAM, then to the high resolution SAM. We scanned several samples. We didn't find a lot of magnetic uh, or, or um, ferromagnetic particles, but we did see some particles that resemble um, pedogenic uh, magnetite, about um, half a micron to a micron. We did see this really nice uh, extraterrestrial spheroid, which means that we are seeing some link to the soil because this was flushed from the soil. Uh, not a lot of titanium ferromagnetic minerals, and we did see some, but very little um, um, detrital magnetite. All right, so the next step is go deeper into the origin of that signal, try to de decouple it or mix it. Uh, so after the IRM at about 1.5 Tesla, we uh, was followed by 95 demagnetization steps. And what we can see here, so we ran that for both species of themes, but also for soil from above the cave and clay that was washed through a fissure into the cave sometime during the Holocene. And of course, the, the host rock. Uh, so from this plot, I guess the take home is that we're, there, there's a component in the dolomite that cannot be fully demagnetized. And once we unmix it or try to unmix it, we, we see that it's not, it's not apparent in this period theme. So not a large contribution from the dolomite, from the host rock. And next we look at the coercivity spectra. So one thing we can see here is that the high coercivity component of the soil is lower than that of stalagmites. And when we look at the estimated contribution from the of each component from the unmixing uh, process, we see that the high coercivity component is much lower in the soil and clays than in the sphelia themes. So what we, how we interpret it is that magnetic particles are mainly derived from the soil. So that's great because that's uh, the working hypothesis. And these grains are incorporated into the sphelia themes after they're filtered into smaller grain size through the car system. And well, this is very preliminary, but we think we see this filtration increases with host rock thickness. So we're kind of, we support our underlying assumption that magnetic particles are derived from the soil and transported and filtered through the pores. Now we can continue to construct our magnetic isotopic time series. Um, one side of the plot uh, looks at the early Holocene sample, 220 for those of you who remember, and then we're looking at the mid Holocene sample. So slightly different colors, but they're plotted here on the same graph. Uh, on the top are the uranium thorium ages used for the age model, the delta 18O, delta 13C um, records with the new age model that correlates with the IRM normalized by mass and then by uh, growth rates. So this gives us the IRM flux. All right. So the first thing we know is just visually the the delta C13 profile really resembles most the IRM profiles, but not so much the delta, the oxygen, the delta 18 o Now, this is because delta 18 o is interpreted, at least for Sorek Cave, as annual decadal rainfall variations. And the delta C13 is the response of the soil organic matter. So this, may this works on a longer uh, time scales and is also, as we hypothesize, directly linked to the detrital flux into the cave. Um, another thing I highlighted here are the climate periods. So this is Sapropel from Eastern Mediterranean cores and Spilio themes. Um, this is a period that's, um, that's been suggested to 
Um, this is a period of uh, soil regeneration in the Eastern Mediterranean circus. And these are those mid-Holocene wet and dry cycles. So just to ask, you know, answer our, our first question, which, which is the most appropriate index? We're technically looking at the same measurement normalized in two different ways. Um, the concentrations, the IRM um, math normalized values are about half an order of magnitude different between the two mice. Now we can just simply explain this by the drip specific nature of course hydrology. And we can actually support that because we have a, a previous work of the, we have a previous geochemical model that looks at trace elements for uh, different sites in the cave. And it shows that the shallower sites see higher fraction of soil derived elements in the drip water. And this is what we're seeing here, uh, just in the form of the triddle components. So, when we look at the flux, the, the triddle um, flux into the cave, we see that it's more or less the same. The mean values are almost uh, identical and the overlap, though slightly different, is definitely within the range uh, you know, of error for our very weakly magnetized uh, samples. So we conclude that, at least for this case, the IRM flux is a potential normalized index for comparing multiple samples from the same cave. Now that we've established that, we're going to talk a little bit of uh, paleoclimate and look at Sapropel 1. So we remember this positive delta C13 excursion almost to host rock values. And that one is negatively correlated with IRM. Uh, so we have low IRM values. And these are supposed to represent wet conditions. And the, when we still, we get very low IRM, so similar to the tropics. Um, this may be due to either removal or erosion of, or shutdown of soils in the region, or just another option is hydrological routing. So we get more runoff that goes through fissures into the cave and sees a lot less of the soil. Um, this leads us to a question of how wet was the Sapropel actually in the Eastern Mediterranean? That's a very, that's a very debated topic. So Sorek suggests very pluvial conditions. Jada Cave in Lebanon, um, that hints for maybe drier conditions. Um, if we look at the Dead Sea, then the lake level does not rise as considerably. Um, but at the same time, we see a lot of uh, mud deposition and less salt. And those salt is usually deposited in warmer, drier conditions. So can this, can the magnetic records, can the magnetic influx into the cave help us resolve this? Um, well, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we do see that after the regeneration of soil in the Mediterranean region, we get this uh, Delta C13 values uh, return to their uh, C3 vegetation uh, equal, um, rather than host rock values. And the magnetic flux into the cave returns to pre sapropel values. So this may suggest that we did do something, like something did happen to the soils. And since we are at a period of low dust influx from the Sahara, the green Sahara, if, uh, if you want, um, there may be less development of new soils or, or, uh, or just the formation, the rate of, the, of formation of soil uh, decreases during this time. Um, yeah, and that's that. Okay, so what we think what we want to suggest is that magnetic particle flux can be a valuable tool for the physical aspect of soil erosion and maybe rates of uh, pedogenesis. And this also helps us resolve questions regarding interpretation and interplay between chemical proxies and then um, the isotopic or trace elemental uh, proxies or even unconventional isotopes that um, we investigate in spilly things. 
Now, this takes us to the mid Holocene, where we see these very clear wet dry cycles with the lower delta C13 values representing wet, wetter periods, um, or interpreted as wetter periods. And a similar, you know, similar cycles are apparent in the magnetic particle flux into the cave. But this time, the high magnetic flux increases with increase of rainfall, not necessarily in the peaks, but we're, um, yeah, but this suggests maybe pedogenic production or increased flushing into the cave. Now, what you'll notice is that the IRM records is in period, but it's out of phase. Um, with the delta C13 values, which is really interesting because um, what we can do with this is just ask the question of what causes this lag and what can it help us with. So um, Josh actually suggested that what we're seeing is the rapid physical translocation of overlying uh, of the soil into the cave versus the chemical process, so the organic matter turnover rates, which are in the orders of 20 to 100 years. Um, this is interesting because though we haven't really experimented with it much, the change in the nature of the, of the, the gap and the phase shift with, and coupled with the, how this event um, is apparent in the uh, isotopic record can tell us a lot about uh, the rates and of of climate change and um, and rapid climate transitions in the area, which brings us back to um, the effect on uh, human culture and transition in the archaeological record. All right, so that was pretty much it. I'm just gonna uh, highlight a few of the main points. The iron flux is a potential normalized index for comparing multiple samples. Um, there's not a simple or constant relationship of high IRM, high rainfall or low rainfall, and, and especially even in the same site. And this is also apparent in, in, in a study from uh, Eleonora Regatieri um, from 2017. And finally, and that really needs uh, some more investigation, but really fascinating aspect is that the synchronization with other proxies, um, in this case, isotopic, but could be elemental, can be used to look at, change, at the rates of change in vegetation, soil dynamics, carbon turnover, um, a whole host of other um, things that happen in the soil. And that really helps us better understand rapid climate transitions in the Holocene. So yeah, thank you very much. You're a bunch of references, which you probably can't read. So I'm going to go back to the final slide. And any questions? Thanks, you all. Are there any questions out there? Go ahead, no, no. Hi. Um... I'm going to ask uh, the question about the um, carbon isotopes and the IRM. Um, why do you think the IRM leads and the carbon lags? I know you explained it, but um, I would think that you have these organic, organic dissolved organic matter that is transported faster to the to the speleothem by the by the water. Um, so this would be, in my opinion faster than uh, transport of particles, but, you know, my intuition may be wrong. Could you? Yeah, well, it, obviously, it's a very simplified 20-minute uh, talk kind of explanation. Um, yes, you're correct. There are so many parameters to look at, and this may be region-specific. Um, so you can also claim that, that as you increase uh, rainfall, you get more pedogenic mantle type forming. So that can also something that I didn't really take into account um, when suggesting this model. Um, but these, the fact that you are transporting this organic um, molecules into the cave 
faster, or there are two parameter, there's two variables you need to look, look at. First, the ratio of the delta C13 that is, you know, from organic uh, molecules versus um, dissolved in organic carbon. Um, and of course, you can do that by just looking as I think, um, I think Zhao looked at the uh, organic component in the, in the secondary thing. So that's one way of, of doing that. And the second is those organic molecules are not, they, yes, sure, they flush alongside the, uh, the uh, magnetic components, but their, their um, value changes as soil carbon changes. And that takes decades to um, centuries. Depends on the climate and the region and soil. So is the idea that you just need a little bit of time for the soil biota to respond yeah. to a change in precipitation. And then as soon yeah, as it so does, it's transmitted down into the cave. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Ken, did you want to ask a? Yeah, uh, yeah. Th thanks for the talk. I don't know. Can you? See? I'm on my phone now. This is weird. Um, um, so very interesting. And we see at much longer time scales when we look from Lankovich cycles, we see uh, you know increase in, in magnetic concentrations, which we think is due to increased rainfall at the Lankovich scale. But at your scale, I'm interested in the paleomag. So these magnetic particles are created in the soils and then washed down into the speleothems. How, how do they, did you tell us how they, you think they get oriented to record the paleomag? Have you thought about that? Um, is, is, um, well, actually my, um, maybe Ron can give you a better answer because uh, he did a lot of, uh, of orientation studies on these um, stalagmites. They specifically, we didn't, we just look at the uh, remnant magnetization. So we just magnetized the samples and we saw how much uh, uh, magnetization, it, how much of the signal it, it can keep. So that gives you an idea of the concentration of the particles, not their orientation. Right, right. But but people get paleomag out of it too, right? Yes, out of yeah. these. Yeah. And, and so there must is it a just a physical orientation or I'm I'm just curious, that's all. Uh, and yeah, but that's I I wish I could answer that, but that's uh, Ron or uh, Josh's expertise. Okay, and, uh, sorry. Did, no, no. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> It's okay. I think that the general assumption has been that this is a, a T, a, not a TRM, a DRM, a detrital remnant magnetization. Right. And that the idea is that if you were to look very, very closely on any actively growing speleothem, there's at least a hundred microns thick film of water on it uh, at any point. And these particles that are coming in from soil are on the scale of, you know, 10 microns or less. And so there's certainly plenty of room for a particle to rotate with respect to the ambient field. And you know, there's a lot of topography, micro topography on, mm -hmm. on, these, on these kinds of materials. And so as these particles are settling within these thin films of water, the idea is that they're orienting with respect to the field and then the calcite is growing around them and locking in the mm -hmm. field direction. Great. Th thank you. Thank you. Josh, can I say something to Ken? Of course. <laughs> so, um, uh oh, I'm getting lectured. Go ahead. It's very, very short. So we did uh, do some. Um, uh, demagnetization experiments, not some, many, the, um, the NRM is very weak. Like every slice is about 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 8 EMU in terms of EMU. Mm. So uh, still we get from the 10 to minus 7 EMU perfectly straight Zydervel plots. And when we, when we plot the, at least the inclination, we can't get a declination from it. Uh, in um, through time with time versus time and compare it with regional field model, then we get something very very reasonable. Um, and this is for for speleothems that are very uh, clean in terms of magnetic particles and um, other detrital particles. This is the only thing I wanted to comment about. 
And so you see it pretty accurate inclinations is, is the question. Yeah. And yeah. Great. Great. Fascinating. Yeah. Time for one last comment from France. Uh, yeah, it's a question. Is there any um, reason or evidence to, or is it possible that the water that from that the magnetite is coming in into the cave and the calcite that's bespitting out of that water are not, um, so that the magnetite gets fixed, but the water, the calcite from that same water that brought it actually gets crystallized later. So not at the same stratigraphic level in the stalagmite, which mm -hmm. could be at the origin of this lag, it would work. Um. Well, not not in that not in the resolution that we're looking at. I mean, uh, sure, there's a lot of discussion of, of when you do high resolution like sims and micro milling and and how the, the flanks uh, of the spilithines correlate with the with the center of it. But in this case, I mean, the 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 samples we use for for the IRM are about two or three millimeters. Um, so that's what was several, I think, I think the resolution is about uh, 20 to 40 years at, at best. Um, um, what we, the one thing I can tell you is that, you know, physically when comparing it on the sample, the peak that we're seeing in the IRM is definitely offset from the physical position of the peak of the um, of the um, of the uh, isotopic measurements. Thank you. Josh, can I make a rapid, you a rapid comment? Really fast, because we're running yeah. way uh, behind you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just about uh, you. I saw you use uh, demagnetization of IAM. I, I just suspicious because later you interpret the difference in the coercivity in terms of selective transport, but. Um, if we believe in, in the Sindowski test, if you if we have great interaction, uh, when you use demagnetization or right, then we can have a uh, lower coercivity, not because of mineral and lower coercivity, because because you have more great interaction. So I'm just suspicious and I'm wondering if, if it's better to use IRM acquisition instead of demagnetization. Uh, it just just uh, just a rapid uh, observation. Okay. Uh, definitely food for thought. I think we ought to take a break. We are running.